Hey guys, welcome back to the New England Aquarium. I'm Nick, this is Taylor. You're likely to see Sarah hanging around in the background too. She's one of our aquarists. She's doing some work in the exhibit. So on a Saturday like today, typically this exhibit would be so busy that it would be hard for you to actually get up to the front of the tank and touch the animals. So we thought we would bring you some interesting information about what's happening in this exhibit that on a busy day you don't always think about asking. Um, maybe some insider information, stuff that you might not notice right away. So we're going to kick it off by Taylor telling us a little bit about one kind of shark that we have in the tank. It's really cool. Yeah, so this is a shark that typically likes to hide in between the tree roots and has excellent camouflage. So if you're not paying close attention, you might not notice them. But they are definitely one of my favorites in this exhibit, and that is our epaulet sharks. Um, epaulet sharks get their name from the big black eye spots on their shoulders. Um, and the, if you've ever seen a military uniform, that fancy piece on the shoulder, that's called an epaulet. So somebody thought it looked like they were wearing epaulets and that's how they get their name. Um, but my favorite thing about them is that they are in a group of sharks called walking sharks. Essentially what this means is they can use their pectoral fins and their pelvic fins almost like little feet to move along in the sand, just like Nick is demonstrating right there. Thank you, Nick. Um, but I think that um, the really cool thing that uh, is about this walking shark is this actually will allow epaulet sharks to come out of the water and walk on land. I know, some people are like, this is my worst nightmare! Uh, sharks that walk on land! But it's really actually very cool. So epaulet sharks spend a lot of their time in tide pools in and around coral reef areas. Now tide pools, when the tide goes out, that water becomes pretty low in oxygen. So they have to move from tide pool to tide pool. But when the oxygen dips, they can also do something else pretty incredible. They can survive in low oxygen environments and they do this by essentially shutting down parts of their body to conserve oxygen. So not only are we looking at epaulet sharks for the amazing adaptations they have of being able to walk on land, but also the medical field is studying them right now to figure out exactly how they do that without any damage to their bodies. Because amazing, imagine what we could do if we could do the same thing, just shut off parts of our bodies to conserve oxygen. Wild, right? Um, so that's the epaulet shark, and um, they like to typically hang out in the tree roots, again, on the center section of the tank over here, and then Actually, in this tangle of mangrove fruits, kind of right behind Nick and I, is another favorite napping spot for our epaulet sharks. And if you want to get an up close view of them the next time that you're here, our Science of Sharks exhibit is a great opportunity to see some epaulet pups. So, I think that is my uh, insider tip for checking out a cool animal here at the aquarium. But Nick also has a cool insider tip that you probably would never know if you didn't ask really true yeah one of the questions we do get very often is how to tell the difference between a male and a female shark or ray and the truth to that question is that males have an organ that's on the underside of their body below their tail that's called claspers it basically looks like two little pencils and they stick out underneath their tail and the females don't have this organ present underneath their body both rays and sharks so you can look for the presence of these claspers to indicate whether the animal is a male or a female. It turns out, in this tank, you're only going to find one male. All the rest of the animals are females. The only male is our male leopard whiptail ray. Uh, for those of you guys that have visited the aquarium before and been to this tank, that animal should be pretty familiar to you. Very large. It's our largest animal in the tank. It is one of our rays, again. It has that leopard skin pattern and that long tail that resembles a whip. Very often the male and the female can be seen hanging out near each other. Now that you know how to tell the male from the female, you can look for the presence of those claspers. But the male is also a lot darker than the female is. And this is a species that is found in the Indo-Pacific region, sort of north of Australia, and in the area around Indonesia. And they have a color pattern that really works out well for them, particularly in mangrove habitats where there isn't as much of this white sandy bottom and there is more dark sediment and leaf litter and things. It really helps them to blend in in those spaces. So that's a cool little fact. All the rest of the animals are females in this tank. There's actually another good reason for that as well too, Taylor. Yeah. When you put male and female animals together, well, 
things can happen sometimes. <laughs> We'd like to have more control over that. And so while we do have males of the species in this tank, they live in another tank that's actually downstairs behind the scenes here in our west wing area. That way we can control, we can have a little bit more control over who is mating with each other and producing offspring. That does regularly happen with some of our animals. We just would like to have a little bit more influence on when it's happening so we can be prepared to take really good care of the offspring. We so, should only have babies that we planned for. <laughs> that's right. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So let's talk about some more cool things related to this exhibit. What yeah, do you say, Tara? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so another one of my favorite things in this exhibit is actually the viewing window that Nick and I are standing in front of. There's three viewing windows in this exhibit. And if you're leaning over them touching, you might not think to bend down and look through them. But this is one of my favorite views of the Shark and Ray Touch Tank, particularly because you'll start to notice that it looks really, really different underneath the surface. The animals are gonna look a little different, um, but the terrain in the tank looks way different. In fact, the back of our exhibit on the far side of the touch tank is really deep. If I were back there, it would be well over my head. Um, and so you get to see some cool, unique behavior. And when you look through the windows, you really get to appreciate just how deep the back of this exhibit is. And so, in fact, when our aquarists get in here to do exhibit maintenance, they have to get into full scuba gear in order to clean the back of this tank, which is, I think, pretty awesome. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Can't miss up a chance to go scuba diving, right, Taylor? Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Another really interesting thing about this exhibit, we think, is the fact that we've got a, lift, a lot of different types of animals together in this exhibit. Right now, we have currently seven different species of rays, and we have five different species of sharks. Some people come in and wonder, would you normally see all of these animals living together out in the ocean? And the answer is no. While they do all prefer the same general type of habitat, a warmer part of the ocean where you might find coral reefs and mangrove forests growing, they are not typically all from the same part of the ocean. Some are native to the tropical and temperate Atlantic Ocean, some from the tropical Pacific Ocean, some can also be found in the tropical Indian Ocean too. So they're actually animals that wouldn't all normally coexist together in the same space. But I can say, that none of these animals are really predators of each other. And so that allows us to keep them all together in this exhibit, take really good care of them. We don't have to worry too much about any aggressive behavior towards each other, but we still work really hard to provide them with plenty of food and top level medical care to make sure that they stay really healthy. But you wouldn't normally see all of these different species together out in the wild. They're mostly really good touch tank animals. They're pretty mellow, they're not super phased by humans having hands in the water, and they all get along pretty well. So they're, they're more chosen to be good touch tank animals than to represent a specific geographic location. So I think at that point, we're, we're gonna wrap it up. Um, thank you again for coming and joining us today. We look forward to seeing you back here soon with some more unique content, um, and again, maybe not just uh, Nick and my face, we might rope, rope in a few other educators um, while we're close and they're um, not busy educating all of our visitors. So <laughs> um, we'll see you back here soon. Thanks again for tuning in. Yeah, come back soon. <laughs>